Thank you all for coming this afternoon. Our speaker is James Urquhart. He's the manager of cloud computing and data center virtualization in the data center solutions group at Cisco. And he is also a uh, blogger on uh, the CNET blogs, very popular uh, blog called The Wisdom of Clouds. And you can find it on uh, the CNET blogs. I was actually in academic computing uh, my first job out of college. I worked for Cornell College in, in Mount Vernon, Iowa. and. Uh, and this is back in the, the pre-286 days, actually, when I started at first. But um, I can tell you some stories about, uh, you know, networking a campus that's the, on the highest hill in the state of Iowa, entirely with copper twisted pair, <laughs> and having to have the little jacks in the wall and reminding the professors to pull the jacks out before, you know, a thunderstorm or before they went home every night just in case in order to, uh, to save what few serial cards we could save every year. Um, and that all went fiber not long after I left, but uh, um, but it's you know I've always had kind of a place in my heart for for uh, higher education and for computing uh, in, in higher education. I think uh, we're going to talk a little bit about what I think is one of the most exciting and disruptive things happening, not only for business but but certainly in in, in the education space, um, which is this concept of cloud computing. And we heard one definition of cloud computing in the keynote session just a little while ago. Um, and I'll, I'll go through uh, mine a, um, in a little bit, which is a little bit different, but I think there's a lot of overlap, and I'll explain how that works. But it's the first thing you're going to learn about cloud computing is that nobody can really define it precisely for you, um, which is bad, because when you're having a conversation, it makes it very difficult to, to kind of nail down whether a vendor is really going to give you all those economic benefits you hear about cloud computing. Um, but it's great because it means it gives a lot of opportunity for innovation in, in the space and in sort of in the technologies that people drive towards the cloud because of the interest in the cloud today. And, and I personally am a believer that the variety of technologies that are showing up um, in terms of how we define cloud is really, really fascinating. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to step you through a little bit of a survey with kind of a higher education bent to it of what's going on in cloud computing today, what it is, what, what the different uh, uh, types of technologies that are out there, what the different players are that maybe you should be aware of. Um, and then I'm going to step you through a little bit of the future um, and take you up to this concept um, of, uh, which is a, a long-term concept, I'll, I'll, let me set expectations correctly, but this concept of the inner cloud, of having very much like in the communications network, we ended up with the internet, a loosely coupled, very dynamic, um, very, uh, you know, supplier, um, consumer independent uh, network environment for content. Um, we see the same thing for IT resources of various types, everything from compute to application services and functionality um, happening as well in the long term. And we'll talk, we're going to talk through that today um, as much as we can in 45 minutes. So let's, let's burn through. Um, so here's a cloud. <laughs> it's a little bit emblematic of what's going on in the market space right now. It's, it's this big whirlwind churn that's tearing everything up in its path. But it also, there's an interesting story to be told around um, the actual weather event as, as an example of something that may come up where cloud computing now has some distinct advantages over what we've been doing with traditional, what I call static IT or siloed IT environments. Um, and just as one example, so first you, you have the end user. Let's, in this case, let's just say that this is a, uh, you know, this is a computer science professor who wants uh, a whole large amount of lab resources, but, but it's not a, a fixed set of lab resources. It's a very dynamic set that they want to have available. I thought the example given in the keynote of having you know, a, a virtualized representation of every computer system ever made was actually a really fascinating example of this, right? Having the ability to have available images um, have available the compute capacity or the storage capacity or the network capacity to be able to really do interesting things, but to not have to deal with building out that environment entirely um, on campus with your own money, but to share that expense with a wide variety of institutions or even a variety of institutions and businesses that have similar needs um, and just may want to use the underlying physical resources differently. But, but have the same need for, for essentially the same physical resources underneath. Um, now you can imagine an event in which, say, a hurricane is about to approach a, a coastal community, in which suddenly now this, this professor is saying, well, you know, am I going to shut down my facility 
lock it up, board it up, walk away from it, and hope that nothing happens to it? Or can I actually move the compute loads that my students are working on from the facility that's in the path of the storm to a facility that's safe and, and out of the way of, of harm's way? So one of the elements of cloud computing, and this is not just true, you know, I, I talk a lot about servers. I'm in the data science space, so I talk a lot about servers and storage and things like that. But this is also true for, for accounts around things like, um, uh, you know, your administrative systems, your registration systems, your e-learning systems, all those kinds of things. Um, it can also be true for the programming <coughs> environments that are being used. So you may have, um, and I'll talk through each of these levels in a little bit more detail. So you've got, you've got these resources that are available um, can you abstract them from the underlying physical infrastructure enough to make them mobile, even if you have to shut them down and bring them up somewhere else, make them mobile in some way, shape, or form across environments. So that's one of the things because what you're doing is, is you're paying for, well, let me, let me move forward a little bit. So that's, so that's one element is to give that flexibility and agility to the end user of the resources themselves. There's also um, in this scenario potentially a, a government environment as well in which, uh, you know, city, um, that's in the path of the storm, they want to use providers within their boundaries. They want their tax base to get the support. Um, but if they're in the path of the storm, they want to temporarily get stuff out of there, move it to another, ven another vendor for a period of time, not lose the services that they're going to be required, and then move it back into the city as soon as it makes sense and is safe to do so, right? So this pay-as-you-go notion is an important part as well, in which, we're which we want to make sure in cloud computing world that it becomes extremely cheap to make the decision to utilize a resource for a period of time, knowing that you can get rid of it and have no responsibility for it once you're done with it. Um, there's a variety of scenarios for that. I'll talk through some of those, more of those as we move through. And then an another scenario is then the emergency services that want to move into the area after the event has taken place. So there may not be compute resources immediately available within the environment. So you want to set up your communications networks. There's some physical plant that has to go in to do that. But once you've done that, have the data resources available on the cloud from services that are available over the internet. And then also potentially set up infrastructure in the, in the disaster zone or in the um, emergency zone in which you can actually move dedicated application systems into that, once again, very, very mobile, very, very virtualized environment, drop it into a containerized data center that you drop into the environment to reduce latency, to perhaps even increase security by isolating it from the network when it makes sense to do so, and so on. So a big part of cloud computing rests on the, this concept of virtualization, but also, uh, and I'm going to talk through, actually, let's get to that, a definition in which what we're really talking about with cloud computing, um, my definition isn't a specific one that you're going to look at and you're going to go say, oh, this, this gives a picture in my mind of exactly what you're talking about. I'm going to give, I give a bounding definition. This is the way I talk about it, is I give you a definition that you can use as a little bit of a litmus test. As you look at everything, you can kind of say, okay, well, is it abstracted from underlying physical infrastructure? So do I, do I not care about what physical infrastructure the service I'm using is running on? Um, can, it, can it happen anywhere um, as long as it meets my service level objectives and gives me the services that I require? Um, is it provided on demand? Meaning, um, do I have to sign something up front that says I've got a two-year lease on this thing? That's not really cloud computing. It, am I able to go in through some portal and say, okay, I need, you know, um, I, need a, uh, um, I need a mail account. Um, but I may only be using that mail account for a promotion that's going to run for six months. And then when I'm done with that, I kind of want to shut the account down. I don't want to pay for that email account anymore, right? Or, um, or servers are, are the, the, the primary thing that people talk about in which, um, and I'm going to talk in more depth about it, you, know, you may have a research environment um, in which they just want to try something that needs 2,000 servers to see if it'll work. Now, in your current budgeting environment, how easy would that be to do, right? But in a cloud computing world, they can just go get 2,000 servers, give it a try, and when they're done, pay for the few thousand dollars or hundred dollars, um, and I'll, I can tell a story about a few hundred dollars that, that's actually really cool, um, and then be done with it. Um, at scale is an interesting one because really in a cloud computing environment, you want the illusion of infinite scale, meaning you don't want to worry about can I allocate another account for this, this uh, you know, student application, or, um, or can I get another programmer on here writing another piece of code. Right, you want the illusion that if I go in and ask for additional resources, I'm going to get them, unless there's a really drastic reason why not. 
So the truth of the matter is there's no such thing as infinite amount of resources, so it's up to the provider, and that provider could be you, um, to make sure that there's adequate automation and efficient usage of underlying infrastructure to make sure that, that the purchase of additional resources is, you know, is only needed when your capacity grows to the point, when your re demand grows to the point where it's re required that you do so. Um, and then the final is a multi-tenant environment. That's not so much for the end user, that's for the producer of the service, whatever the service is. It's, it's much, much more cost effective to be able to have customers share physical infrastructure, share code bases, share um, uh, all the support services and everything else that goes around the environment. Um, and that's really important for making cloud computing economically viable. If Amazon.com was giving everybody an individual physical server to meet their needs, they would not be able to do what they do at 10 cents a CPU hour or up to 80 cents a CPU hour, right? It just would not be possible to do. So multi-tenant is really the, the economic driver to making cloud computing a, competitive, uh, a compelling story. And if you're wondering what's the difference between traditional managed hosting and cloud computing, that's probably it. Right? It's probably that, that instead of trying to figure out how to get you a, dynamic, a physical server when you need a physical server, now it's to get you the compute capacity that you need with the illusion that it's a physical server that you're using. But in reality, underneath, that they're able to then combine resources and share that. Um, if that scares you that you're sharing systems with other people, then, you know, then, then think long and hard about using cloud computing because the, the idea with cloud computing is, is that the security boundaries, the trust boundaries are gonna get virtualized as well. And, um, and so you're gonna be sharing physical environments but, but everybody's aware of the security risk there and everybody's, all of the vendors are looking for ways to guarantee to you that customer A is not gonna be able to hack into customer B um, as a result of that. And there's a tremendous amount of security going in at all the different compute layers um, and network layers um, to, to make that the case. Um, three main classes here um, of, um, of cloud computing. Um, and this is really what we call the SPI model. Those of us who talk about cloud computing a lot. There are other classes of stuff you can talk about, but they almost all kind of boil back up to one of these three. Um, software as a service is targeted at the end user. Right? It's, it's about application functionality being delivered over the cloud to people. So the, the idea is get an account to do customer relationship management or student registration or um, e-learning or whatever it might be. Um, platform as a service is targeted at the developer. It's about giving the developer an opportunity to write the applications that they want without having to manage and operate the infrastructure that the applications run on. So uh, and I'll talk through some of the specifics here, but Google App Engine's a great example. They have a Java programming environment. You write your Java application to their library set. You can test it on your local machines to make sure it works. But then when you push it to the Google environment, they handle scalability completely for you without you knowing how they do it. They handle uh, backups for you. They handle failover situations for you. Um, really, all you do is make sure that your application comes up and runs the way you want it and that the functionality operates the, the way that you want it to operate. All the operational issues are taken care of for you. Um, now, whether you get an SLA around that's a different story, but um, we can <laughs> talk about that uh, as we move forward here. Infrastructure as a service is targeted at the system administrator. Now, the reality is the system administrators that are using the cloud, the early versions of the cloud, are being asked to be developers a little bit too. There are APIs in order to control the environments rather than simple, necessarily simple command line ways of doing things. But that being said, um, the idea is that you allocate the components that you need for a, a data center to run an application on um, as if they're, you're getting a server, as if you're getting a network device, as you're getting a storage device, and you're primarily then assembling your application stack from these components, these virtualized components that are running out on the cloud. So there's an awful lot of business, um, startup business building on this right now, right? So startups instead of, in fact, if you talk to the VCs in the Valley now, if you're doing a web application, if you're doing a social networking application, if you're doing anything that would require a data center in the past, they're gonna ask you to figure out a way to do your business model on Amazon, on GoGrid, on um, Maso, Slicehost, Fluxoscale, those guys, because they don't have to buy the capital up front for something that, which, that may be a failed vend, uh, venture. They're just gonna pay for the capacity that you consume while you're building the business. If you grow to a point where it suddenly is more economically viable to have your own data center, which is certainly the case when you get up to certain sizes, 
Um, then they're willing to say, okay, now it's time for a round of investment about building out that data center because you've proven the business model and we know we're going to make profit off of it. But they don't have to take that leap early. So infrastructure as a service is a huge play, will be for a long time. It's probably one of the areas that will be most visibly fought out um, for a period of time. There's the, there's the old, you know, there's the old improperly attributed to Thomas Watson of IBM quote about there'll be five computers in the world, there's only need for five computers in the world. What, what it may seriously boil down to is there may only be five large compute utilities in the world and a thousand, two thousand boutiques that are doing specialized services around that. Um, but but if in terms of raw compute capability, as the, as the big guys get more and more efficient and get more and more economies of scale out of being multi-tenant, having multiple data centers globally, being able to move workloads globally around their data centers, it's going to be harder and harder to justify going out there and, uh, and building a new data center for a single application or for a small group of stuff unless you've got some new value to add there. So infrastructure as a service is, um, is you know, certainly a major early play. Um, but you see really good companies in all these, Salesforce.com, Cisco's WebEx is a software as a service around communications. Um, and, uh, and the platform as a service space, which some question the viability of, um, others are finding really good ways to use it. And Google App Engine is actually starting to take off as a pretty major platform. There's a limited market for platform as a service, it's developers. But those developers are going to build applications that are going to run on that infrastructure. And Google is going to make a ton of money off of other people's SaaS services running on their platform. So two types of cloud to kind of really pay attention to. The first one I want to talk about is pu a public cloud. Public clouds essentially are services being delivered over the internet of the types that we've been talking about um, around cloud computing. The big thing with a public cloud is that they are going to provide for you the interfaces to control the computing environment. They're going to provide you a portal that you go to to allocate servers. They'll provide you with um, an API set by which your programs can go and specifically for their environment alone, request services and request resources. Um, if you write an application that's distributed and runs on three different clouds or four different clouds in order to fulfill its services, you're going to go to three or four different control environments in an all public cloud environment in order to maintain that application. That being said, um, these are the easiest services to get to because you don't have to own anything at all to get into to operating them, right? You go to the website, you provide a credit card, you're good to go. Um, there's some major moves underway to standardize the management interfaces in, in all clouds, but public clouds will benefit a lot from it so that you can have maybe have a management tool that would work with five or six different clouds. But in the end, the control over what are the trust's um, boundaries for the environment, you know, where do you go to set the firewall policies, where do you go to set, um, store your images, where do you go for all that, all that's going to be on that cloud. That public cloud provider is going to provide all of that technology in one bundled package. Private cloud, on the other hand, um, not to be confused with an internal cloud or an on-premise cloud, right? It, um, they're, they're parallel or tangential, I guess, um, terms. So. Um, private clouds are not about where the resources run, they're about where the control of the resources are. So to the definition that I gave earlier, with a private cloud environment, you want the illusion that you're going to have a cloud computing environment of your own. Initially, that might be all your own internal stuff. That might just be the stuff that you own and that you compute with. Um, Eventually, though, there will be a, a set of services that we are calling at Cisco and with VMware, our partners at VMware, we're calling virtual private cloud services in which service providers that have this capacity they want to sell you will have a service that you can tie into your private cloud that will let you consume those services but still with the illusion that you have your own cloud. Right, so your cloud now is incorporating some Amazon source resources or incorporating some GoGrid resources into the environment that you set up with the trust boundaries that you set up. So the firewall rules, the, um, the, the identity systems, um, the, the encryption um, um, policies, network policies, storage policies, all those things that appear to be within a boundary of control, boundary of, of uh, trust. Um, are going to be extended out to include those environments as if they were now being brought into your data center, right? That's the illusion that gets set up. Um, so private clouds are very, very important for those that want to um, maintain 
the you know maintain the illusion of having a, sort of an IT environment, um, whether or not they're using internal resources or external resources or some combination between the two. Um, a really good way of getting a sense of this is if you use VMware at all or use any of the, the virtualization environments and you have a management console for those environments. Imagine that management console being able to manage virtualized resources in your data centers on one campus, your data centers on another campus, and data centers in Amazon, right? Um, that, that's sort of the, the, the illusion of, of sort of one center of control that we see with private clouds. And so private clouds are, um, we believe that most businesses that have large investments in IT um, for the computing that, that, for specialized computing that they do, um, or for highly secure environments that they're very, very concerned about intellectual property leaking or personal data leaking, are probably going to start with private cloud internal private clouds and are going to begin to, as the trust systems build up, um, extend that out. So let's talk a little bit about some sort of examples of how these are getting used. So um, first of all, uh, cloud computing is having a serious effect already on research and on modeling of any type in general. So um, the David Powers, the, CE, the CIO of Eli Lilly, did a webcast with Information Week, I think it was uh, um, a couple of months ago. And in that webcast, he said something extremely interesting. He said, look, as a result of our researchers being able to go get resources on Amazon and we're building some internal private clouds uh, for this purpose as well, they can get resources so quickly to just try something or just run a big data mining job or something along those lines that they're reconsidering the way they are doing research, not reconsidering the way they apply IT to research, they're reconsidering how they plan and budget and the activities they take on as a part of each research project. For instance, instead of having to figure out before they budget for a drug trial what exactly they're going to, what exact hypothesis or, or test they're going to they're gonna target initially um, in order to know what IT resources they're going to need in place to do whatever it is that's related to that and planning everything they need to budget for that project up front. Um, they're able to go out and say, here's, our, here's this year's budget for this project. Here's the data and the general theories we're going to work with to go after. Here's a justification for doing the project. And actually s take a large chunk of data that may already exist, clinical data, and do things like uh, genetic analysis or, um, or looking for patterns in, uh, in, um, in diagnostics and so on to figure out whether or not there's, there's a more specific path they should take as they move forward with the project. So um, they can take 2,000 servers and put, you know, five terabytes of data up on a, um, up on a cloud environment, get 2,000 servers to run a job against that data. And if it didn't work out, they're out a month of processing fees plus the storage of the, of the data plus maybe some bandwidth for, for sending and returning the data, right? They're, they're out a few hundred or a few thousand dollars. They're not out the tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars in capital equipment they would have to do to build that in-house and get that same thing. So this is, this is already real. Eli Lilly talks already about the fact that they are going to push more and more and more of not just research, but, but just everything that they do in the business to a cloud computing model of one sort or another as they go forward. They there's also a bunch of work that you guys are probably aware of, or if you're not aware of, then l let me make them aware, make you aware of them now. There's there's a number of of sort of out of the old academic grid computing world. Um, there's a number of projects that are going on around providing large scale compute capacity clouds to um, to uh, academia. So Google and IBM have partnered on one. Uh, the NSA just announced a bunch of grants to get people to use that cloud. Um, HP, Yahoo, and Intel, or as I like to call them, Yahoo Tel, um, they've got uh, they've got a test cloud environment in which uh, computer science departments can test very large scale cloud computing concepts uh, with their with their uh, programs and their their uh, their students. Um, and then there's a very interesting one that's actually um, mostly um, centered right around Ohio, the states around Ohio, the Open Cloud Consortium, which is expanding out quickly, that's looking to build a very open, uh, multi-institution cloud environment that uses, uh, I believe they're going to use uh, the, the um, National Lambda Rail uh, infrastructure to, to, for a lot of it. And uh, 
they're going to build out, you know, their idea is to build out the, the standards and the technologies that are necessary to make a very generalized cloud computing platform specifically for academic work. I'm curious, how, how does vendor lock play into all this? It seems like a lot of these cloud things are very vendor specific. You can start building on one, and then when your application's performance expected, you want to move to another. You're left with redoing the entire application to get onto the cloud. Yeah, I'm going to talk in depth about that as we move forward here. But let me just say, and the short thing is, you're you're 100 correct. The interesting dynamic here is the lessons learned from the internet have really sunk in, and so. So what we have now are a lot of the AOL and Prodigy and CompuServe's of cloud computing out there dominating the landscape. And they'll, they'll almost freely admit that they're in a conundrum. They have a huge chunk of the mar market share. The big four are Amazon, Google, Microsoft from a mind share, but they've got a built-in market share because of the .NET um, environment. And uh, Salesforce.com, who from a SaaS environment kind of dwarfs everybody else. Um, those guys will tell you that they're, they're in a little bit of a conundrum because they, they've got so much market share, they, don't, they certainly don't want to lose that. They don't want to lose that momentum. Um, but at the same time, they realize that as soon as an open, federated environment that multiple vendors can join quickly and, multiple cust and customers can dive in and out of at will shows up, then their they're, they're more locked-in environments are in trouble. So there's, there's a huge amount of effort around various standardization things that are going on. The problem is, is we're really in the very early stages. So the, the ones that I'm watching right now is the DMTF, um, the Distributed Management Task Force has announced that they've got a what they call an incubator around cloud standards. Um, so a lot of companies that are involved in that. And I, it sounds like VMware may, may um, offer their vCloud APIs to that um, for standard effort. Um, and then there's there's you know there's a, there's a number of other efforts out there. The Open Cloud Consortium is one of them. There's another one called the uh, Cloud Computing Interoperability Forum. Um, there's a few others out there that are doing the work. I think it's really I, first of all I don't think top down standards are going to win the day. So I, I think having a standards group body go off and do the work and come back and say here's the standard isn't going to do it. Um, I think the ones that are going to work with vendors that are approaching real customer problems and solving them as they go and then contributing that out from a standards perspective are going to work. And what's surprising is from a service provider perspective and from, a, from an infrastructure vendor perspective, everybody realizes that if you don't get to the internet equivalent of the cloud first, you're going to be that company that loses out because you didn't get there. Um, so I think that it's going, to be, it's going to evolve a little bit differently. I'll talk, I'm, I'm actually going to go in depth on this in a second. but. Uh, We'll talk a little bit different about that. Um, about that. Now, I just want to talk about a few others. So, you know, we talk about those those big academic clouds, which are almost all research based. But there's a whole bunch of stuff you guys should be aware of in the cloud that are would be very valuable, I think, to an academic institution to pay attention to. Um, SkyTap. There's other companies in this space, but I only had time to locate their logo. <laughs> Um, but SkyTap's a company that is actually building like a software as a service application on the front of infrastructure as a service. It's specialized towards research and development labs, um, towards demo facilities, test and training facilities where if you want an environment where you control who has access to getting the capacity and setting quotas for what people can get and how they can do it and grouping things by projects so that pro different projects can get built separately from each other, SkyTap's putting together a really, really powerful service that's based on exactly those concepts. And there's other companies that are doing this as well. Um, so you can go, instead of going to Amazon and wondering and worrying about how do I control what people are doing and what they're spending, um, with a company like SkyTap, you can go in and yeah, it may cost you a little bit more to get the service, but in the end, what you're going to get is a very controlled environment for doing cloud computing in which they're going to help you make sure that you have a handle over what's getting consumed and how it's getting consumed. Um, Cloudera and um, Amazon are both doing um, Hadoop-based stuff. This is, this is sort of the new, one of the new application um, uh, types that are showing up, which are these very large data processing things where now, since you can get 2,000 or 10,000 servers quickly and easily, um, you can run these highly parallelized applications across them. What both of these companies are doing is giving you a very easy to manage environment where you can create these distributed, um, the, the algorithm is called MapReduce. Um, I don't have time to go into in depth on that, but, but feel free to Google it. Uh, but the idea is that you can take um, data distributed over many, many machines, 
um, distribute the code to analyze that data over many, many machines, run them all in parallel, return everything, consolidate the results, and have a final piece of the, you know, have a final result that comes back in a fairly quickly amount of time. It's, it's what Google does in their search algorithms, right? So it gives you an idea of how fast things could happen. Um, these are definitely things to watch because if you think about building a grid for your, for your college, your institution, or for anybody that's building grid computing, you can do a lot of what you would normally do in a grid environment on something like this in terms of data mining, in terms of, of uh, you know, a fixed length modeling of protein folding, um, you know, it's a whole bunch of those kinds of things um, that you can now just kind of go to Amazon and do with the Hadoop programming environment. You don't need to own a grid in any way, shape, or form. You don't need to program to a grid API in any way, shape, or form. You're actually, you know, able to kind of distribute this code out in, a, uh, in an open source, open standard kind of fashion. Um, the, uh, the other thing is the, the, the platforms of service things, I think, especially for computer science departments, but for anybody that does a lot of compute jobs where they do custom programming, what's interesting about these guys is that um, you can basically offload all of the ha operational hassle of a programming environment completely to another vendor. So, um, so I talked about Google App Engine with their Java environment. Engine Yard and Heroku are both, um, are both uh, Ruby on Rails environments. Uh, there's, uh, there's Erlang starting to show up there a little bit. Um, there's, there's all these different programming types that are used pretty heavily now um, that, uh, that you can find an environment where you just create an account, you start write for free, typically, start writing code, and when you start executing that code in the environment, that's when you start to pay for it. Um, and by the way, nobody except for the, comp the vendor that's providing the service has to do anything with any servers or networking or wiring or anything like that. Um, and when you have a low um, security issue like the source code for a student's, you know, uh, computer science 101 class that comes up, it actually gets kind of compelling to sort of say, okay, guys, let's go set you up on Google and have at it. Um, and then the final ones I'll point out, it just by sheer coincidence, I picked these two logos. I was actually laughing when I saw this stuff here. But there's, there's a growing number of companies that are addressing e-learning environments. This is a software as a service play in a large way, as long as it's pay as you, go, as you go kind of thing, right? So each student account is built individually or however. Then there's actually something really compelling about these kinds of things as well. The, the one thing I thought was super shocked at, and somebody can correct me if they know something different here, but I went and searched, you know, higher education registration, academic registration, in terms of administrative systems, I really couldn't find much of anything. I think there's a huge opportunity there. I mean, talk about a standardized system that, that would be pretty easy to turn into SaaS. So I'm sure there's a startup somewhere doing that, but that would be something as well that I would look at and say, you know, um, is it more valuable to manage a system in-house for the privacy concerns and things that, 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 that really are there and that, that need to be considered? Or can I get that level of privacy that I require? Can I meet the objectives that I have with somebody else giving me a standardized application that they're writing actually for 50 different institutions so that their costs are way down, which means the costs to me come way down. And um, so that's, that's one space I'll be kind of keeping an eye open on the side on as well, because I think SaaS applications for, for all schools not just higher education is an area that I think I think these institutions are are born to to take advantage of. I mean, I think it's just it's just a natural kind of extension to get rid of you know a lot of data center infrastructure that um, uh, that uh, that supports functionality that's of value, but that that infrastructure itself isn't really valuable, right? So where are we going? So that's a lot about where we are, right? Those are kind of some things to be aware of. But I wanted to walk you through a little bit of a journey. And how much? Ten. Ten more minutes left? OK. And we want to get some questions in, so I'll try to do this very fast. So I'm going to walk you extremely quickly through a little bit of a journey that we're looking at from Cisco's perspective and a lot of companies are looking at with us in terms of how this can go from this fairly siloed cloud environment we're in today to what will feel very much like an internet of compute capacity and IT resources, right? I mean, just a, a very quickly for you to get whatever the resources you need and to choose the company on the fly. Um, Vince Cerf, at, at, uh, uh, who's now at Google, is saying, boy, this looks a lot like the early days of the internet. So we start out with a few individual systems that we're linking together in very kind of tightly coupled ways. Um, 
we're growing that out then by more and more people getting involved, more and more systems being able to be interoperable. Um, we're, we're at the stage now where, for instance, Salesforce.com is makes it easy for you to use Google App Engine. They make it easy for you to use Amazon.com, where it makes sense to support the applications you write to run with Salesforce. Um, and we're going to see the, 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 another one is the academic institutions that are combining their individual compute clouds into larger academic clouds that are sharing resources. Um, eventually, these clusters of networks start to come together into one large whole. And that's really, um, that's really the point where we start to say, okay, you need standards here, like, TC like the TCP IPs and the, and the BSGs or whatever. I, I don't know my networking very well. So, but the, the core underlying network uh, protocols in order to make this happen. And, um, and when you get enough of those and the critical mass starts to grow like crazy, you begin to have this network of service. Now, so far we've done it with communications and content, which is very, very powerful, but it's very human-centric. So what we're talking about really doing is, is, is now repeating a lot of the same process for compute-centric capability, right? Where you have IT systems where you might have a distributed application now that's running across multiple vendors across the internet. How do you make that the latency issues, deal with latency issues, how do you deal with the security issues, and so on. And this is the, the new generation of standards that are gonna have to come up um, things like uh, as simple as IP addressing, right? Because since computes fixed today, IP addresses merge location and an identity into one number, one base. That's not going to work in an intercloud environment because if you're going to be able to move your workloads dynamically, identity of the workload and location of the workload now have to be separated out. So we're working um, with the um, ITF uh, standards organization on a, a protocol called LISP that's called Location Identity Separation Protocol that among its many potential uses is for cloud computing is to enable workload mobility and keeping IP addresses of servers consistent even though they're moving around and, and the routers have to refine that location. Um, so another kind of way to look at all this is, you know, what, what were the killer apps? Well, early on it was communication and email really kind of drove a lot of it. Um, in fact, uh, the only thing I used the, the, the network for uh, outside of my school network was email. I mean, for the longest time, that was the only thing. Um, eventually, though, something came along called hypertext and HTML and HTTP that really kind of made content king for a while, right? And the, 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 the real benefit now is not just so much that you can communicate between person A and person B, but, um, but that, wow, there's just a li an infinite library of information that's available to you now at, at your fingertip. Okay, so that's cool. So where are we today? Um, boy, these social network applications are really kind of the basis of a lot of computing that's going on and a lot of value in the internet. And these networks are kind of funny because they're using, the, um, they're using the network effects of the internet and building new network effects on top of the network effects of the internet. It's very kind of, very cool and interesting thing. Um, and so there's, that's kind of a lot of where we are. The result is that we're just gaining these huge, huge distributed networks on top of distributed networks and the dominant force in um, in computing today where we are right now is Metcalfe's law it's about the increasing value of a network with each individual node added to the network right that you, and and this is if uh, this is um, this is the basis of a lot of things that happen. What we would like to see, and this is the RCTO at Cisco talking, we'd love to see the same thing happen with the cloud computing environment that we saw with the internet. Um, going from standalone clouds to private clouds to eventually the inner cloud. And what that looks like is first and foremost, um, getting to an open cloud environment in which Vendors can offer you services, virtual private cloud services in this case, but also public cloud services that are interoperable in some way so that a market can be established. So you can take the same compute job or the same account need, um, application account need for a generalized type of application and be able to choose in the marketplace who you want to go to with that, that load in a very easy way and move from one to the other reasonably cheaply. It will never be cheap. But it will, the cost can come down to the point where it's not prohibitive for you to make a move where it, made sen where it makes sense to make that move. Um, with the open, once you have an open cloud, the thing about the open cloud, let me go back to this real quickly. The thing about an o just the open, an open cloud alone is 
the, by that definition, you can still have a relationship with each individual vendor that you set up up front. So what I like to call is a tightly coupled relationship with the service providers that you're using. You have an account with Amazon set up beforehand, therefore you're going to do all your, your cloud computing with Amazon, right? What we want to do is decouple that relationship so that you can make a real-time decision based on what it is you're trying to do and based on information provided by the intercloud about what's available to you, about where you want to go to, compute, to, to choose that service, and very important, then have the feedback of the billing and the management and metering and monitoring of, of whatever it is you choose to do to come back through on a standard as well so that you, can, you know that you're going to get an aggregated bill of all the cloud services that you've used um, in a way that <laughs> makes it manageable, right? Because if you, if you end up with you know, 50, 100, 5,000 bills a month, that's not workable, but if I can get it down to where I can combine all of the billing through an aggregator of some sort, a broker of some sort of the services that I'm using, then that makes it a lot easier to deal with. So, so for portability of environments, for the ability to change, um, change providers that you're using for one reason or another, for the ability to discover new services and have new services from the provider's point of view, to, for me to be able to introduce a new service to the entire internet, through a mechanism where they're, where I know they're going to be comfortable coming to me because they're going to get billed and they're going to get all that stuff correctly. That's really kind of the goal of the intercloud. Five to seven years out, easily. So I set expectations correctly. This is not something you'll hear you know, announced by us um, or anybody else anytime soon. But we're looking at what are the equivalents to things like DNS and uh, things like the peering gateways that the, the carriers provide to, to allow traffic to go between their services. Um, what are those equivalents that need to be in place for the intercloud? And there's significant work underway already in those, uh, those areas. So, and standards being a very big one as well. And just to end it real quick, um, I think there's going to be a killer app that comes out of all of this, right? I think, that, I think we don't know yet what it is people are going to be able to do when they have mobile workloads, when they have quick ability to get to random resources um, with the reliability that they know that their trust um, parameters, their, their trust systems, their control systems are going to be involved um, and, uh, uh, and that the standards are going to allow for, for you know, billing and metering and all those things to, to work the way that's, that they're intended to work. Um, I think we don't know yet. I've talked about things like uh, follow the law computing. So you may have heard of follow the sun or follow the moon. Follow the sun says move the workload to wherever it's closest to the people who are going to be using it at a given time. So if you have a 24-7 operation of some sort, you're actually going to move it to wherever the sun is pretty much at any given time. Or follow the moon, which is go to wherever power and, and compute is cheapest, right? Well, that's usually the dark side of the planet. Power rates come down, and so you just move it around that way. Um, follow the law basically says move it to where the regulatory environment is best for the compute task that's about to be taken. All right, <laughs> and uh, so if you have a, a you know aware enough network or aware enough infrastructure to deal with that, you can actually say, okay, well, as long as I'm dealing with privacy data, I'll do this in Madagascar, and then uh, you know as long as I'm uh, dealing with uh, you know uh, um, banking, I'll move it to the Cayman Islands. I mean, this that's a drastic. Example, but who knows, right? The, the, the possibilities are very wide. And uh, with that, I'll say, uh, does anybody have any questions or comments? Dark side of the moon. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> follow the moon. <laughs> Not follow the moon, but land on the moon computing. I like it. You uh, said the reason uh, was you were thinking there's been more likely a bottom up approach rather than a top down approach for standardization in the cloud. I'm still not seeing why. That's going to happen. I'm curious. I don't know the history of the internet, maybe as well as you do. I'm curious to see how the internet formed and why you think it'll be more bottom. I, I think that the parallel to look at is the the WS Star um, uh, uh, software as a service or. Um, uh, service-oriented architecture standards, right? So the SOAP-based service-oriented architecture standards that IBM and Microsoft and everybody have been working. Well, the, the issue that they've had is that it takes years and years to develop the standard, and as they do it, there's development going on not using that standard at the same time, and there becomes a commercially viable alternative before they announce the standard. And so even when they announce the standard, it doesn't mean anybody's implemented it in a commercially successful way. So, so the, there's, a, there's another standard, the, the REST, which I don't remember what it stands for, but 
but uh, resource something. Um, but uh, but REST is a entirely you know it's the way HTML was intended or HTTP I'm sorry was intended to be used up front right and it's just a, a standard now of how you how do you locate a resource and, and, and ask a resource to do something for you or get data from a resource um, and uh, um, and so by the time SOAP got boiled down to a point it got so heavyweight that nobody really, really wanted to implement it because the amount of coding it was going to take to make sure it ran smoothly was intense. And here comes the rest that says, yeah, just call a URL, <laughs> right? And then you get a, you'll get an HTML response that will include the next steps that you can take against that resource and will include the data that you're looking for in some format that you, that you want to consume it. Um, and so th th it's a similar thing where, where the truth of the matter is if these standards bodies go off and try to figure out what's the standard for something as complicated as moving a workload around on, on the internet, which is years out in and of itself, um, m live motion is years, years away itself, um, then, um, then by the time they figure it out and they work out and they get the standards actually working, there's going to be a running implementation from some startup someplace or from some academic effort someplace or whatever that's going to be in place that people are actually going to consume. This is the thing, the other thing about cloud computing that I think is so fascinating. This is the first major IT disruption to appear since open source was assumed, since transparency of, of intellectual property was assumed. Right, so and community and everything else. So one of the things that happened was when IBM went off and wrote this thing they called the Open Cloud Manifesto, and then they worked quietly in the back rooms with some companies, and then they went to Microsoft and said, "Would you sign this?" Microsoft not only said no, but they screamed out loud, "Hey guys, this!" Before they announced this, let me just tell you that this was all done in the back room, right? And and the re, you know the 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 weapon that Microsoft used, which is hilarious given that it was Microsoft, is you know this was not done in the open. This was not done in the, you know we weren't allowed to comment on this before it was you know proposed as a standard. And uh, and I think you know I think the open source community is also looking at cloud computing. If you really think about it, open source is both a threat and a boon to cloud, to open source, right? So everything being done in the cloud is based on open source. But if the only people consuming open source are a few cloud providers, where are all the developers going to come from to, to, to increase the value of the service? So open source folks are looking at this and saying, how do we make sure that the standards that get developed are developed from not just open standards, but open source standards? Um, so that the, the open source projects that are viable, that people can contribute code even though they're not a, a cloud provider, even though they're not actually going to consume the code directly downstream. And uh, so I, I honestly think that that, that kind of approach and, you know, and today, from a management API perspective, the, the, the standard management API is, is Amazon's uh, AWS API. I mean, um, there's a company, there's now a company, was a research project out of um, um, UK, um, UC Santa Barbara that is now a company called Eucalyptus. And Eucalyptus is a cloud infrastructure you can deploy in your data centers. And, and it uses, it, it can actually mimic, you know, a number of APIs. You can write your own API set. Um, but they, they've implemented the Amazon API on the front because that's the one that they got the most demand for by far. So there's a default standard, even though there are all these groups out there trying to figure out, the, figure out what's the management API going to look like. Well, it may have already been determined. If Amazon doesn't, you know, stand up and say, whoa, our intellectual property, we don't want anybody to do it. And they haven't come, come down either side on that. And that pretty much wraps yeah. up. So thank <laughs> Sorry you about all. that. If people have other questions, come up to me. I'm happy to, to talk to you. Thank you.